hope for the holidays. Luke chapter 1, verse number 45. Would you read this verse out loud with me as we begin? And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll strengthen our faith this morning. Thank you for the message and song that we've already been stirred by, for all of the truths that we've encountered as we've thought about your goodness and your mercy and the fact that you came for me. Lord, I pray that you would take your word now and encourage us to strengthen our faith. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for each one that has shared the love of Christ this season already. What a blessed thing it is to see your people exhibit your grace and goodness. Help us to remember the reason why we gather around this week and why it is we do what we do in this time called Christmas. Bless the things that are said this morning, Lord, from your word. Hide me behind the cross of Calvary, which could not have happened were it not for the cradle in which you came and was laid in swaddling clothes in a manger. Lord, I pray that you'll bless your people today, strengthen our faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed is she that believed. This is one of those beatitudes, you know, when you see that word blessed. When you hear the word beatitude, you immediately probably think of Jesus' first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, where he gave that magnificent introduction to any sermon, blessed are, and he just listed this list of blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are they. And just thinking about that blessedness of what it means to be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to have placed our faith in Him. Well, this is Luke's blessed. See, Matthew gave us the Sermon on the Mount that's recorded by the words of our Savior. Jesus hasn't even been born yet. And we're seeing these words given by Luke. Blessed is she that believed. Now, if you are using the authorized version, you'll notice that they've helped us with the translation because they've supplied the, the verb in, in italics. That, that's a way of emphasizing this idea. So if we were to read it very rough and literally, we would read, and blessed, she that believed. Can you sense the excitement in that? Can you sense the anticipation now, we need the word is because otherwise it wouldn't make sense in English. We need, we need some help along the way, right, with this helping verb. But it's in italics for a reason because of the, the force of the language. I just want you to see that. Blessed. There's a happiness. There's a, there's a blessedness that attends faith. You know, I was walking around the other day and I was in a store doing some Christmas. Well, this year it was mostly just window shopping. Probably you and I don't live too far apart. You look at stickers and, well, sticker shock is an understatement anymore with the inflation that we're in. It's just terrible. I know it's uh, just one of those years. And uh, aren't you glad that Christmas isn't always just about a price tag and the kind of plastic stuff you can buy for somebody? I'm thankful that Christmas has a deeper meaning than what we have to shell out of our wallet in front of a counter. Somebody's ringing us out. Well, you know, I was walking around the store the other day and, um, you know, as you're doing that, I, I don't get to pick what's played on the radio. You know, if I if I could go and and, you know, pick the radio dial or the station or, you know, change the CD, I guarantee I wouldn't be playing what was playing in, in the store. But nevertheless, uh, there was a song that it it. it the words kind of made me pause for a minute, and, um, and I was listening. I, I perked up my ears because the phrase that caught my attention was one where John Lennon said, and so this is Christmas, and what have we done? Another year over, and a new one just begun. And I paused because I'm wondering, okay, I need, I need to stop and reflect on that. This is Christmas. What have we done? Another year over and a new one just begun. Though it's not music I would have selected if I were in charge of the radio dial, that's a simple enough statement, and it does echo a profound truth. I'll, I'll give Mr. Lennon that. 
it invited me to pause and reflect. What has this year meant? How have I grown in my faith? What have I learned about my walk with the Lord? Most importantly, it challenged me. Now, I know it probably doesn't challenge everybody this way, but it challenged me to to pause and think about where I find hope as I stand on the threshold of a new year. Now, I can't speak for him, but I would surmise that the place that I, the person that I find hope in is probably different than the author of that song. I'm just going to be candid. And, And I'm thankful that this world isn't all that there is. Now, there are a lot of great things down here that go on in life, but I'm thankful that my Savior has a plan, that He's gone to prepare a a place for me. And I'm glad to report that my hope is not in John Lennon. (laughs) It's not. So today, you know, we look at Luke chapter 1, we consider the account of Mary, the miracles of the Spirit. We seek to find that hope, the, the true hope in Jesus Christ, a hope that that's not just some shallow wish. Right? The, the, the whole mindset behind that kind of thinking is that we need a utopia down here. Well, the Lord has something even better prepared. See, these things are shallow. No, my, my hope is rooted in a certainty of faith and love that Jesus shows me. Now, I'll give you another quote from John Lennon. He's also quoted as saying things like this. Jesus was all right. Now, I can't do the British accent. I'm sorry. I'm just not going to try that here today. Jesus was all right, but His disciples were thick and ordinary. If you need to know what that means, get a British dictionary and look up thick and ordinary. You'll see what He means. It's them twisting it that ruins it for me. That was what John Lennon said. Let me give you his quote so that I don't uh, do him disservice there. Jesus was all right, but His disciples were thick and ordinary. It was them twisting it that ruins it for me. Fundamental misunderstanding. <laughs> because yeah, I, look at, I look at Luke, and uh, we talked about this last time. Why in the world? Nazareth? Of all places? The, the whole Greco-Roman Empire at his disposal? Caesar ruling the emperor, empire of Rome? And yet, God says, I'm going to Nazareth. Um, Pretty ordinary if you ask me, Mr. Lennon. Mary, of all people. What do we know about Mary? We don't know much about Mary. But probably just an ordinary Israelite girl. What am I trying to say to you? God intentionally, intentionally chooses to use people that Mr. Lennon described as thick, ordinary disciples. Like Zechariah. I mean, if anybody had a misstep of faith, it was Zechariah, Zecharias. Like, like Mary, like Elizabeth. <laughs> One of our favorites, Peter. That's who God chose to use to reveal His amazing grace and power. Now, Jesus was sinless. We recognize that. And I think Mr. Lennon would maybe even recognize that based off his, you know, Jesus was all right. If you take all right to mean that He was sinless, I don't know. That might be reading too much into Mr. Lennon's words. But the disciples, uh, let, let me remind us what Peter himself said about the Holy Spirit and giving us the revelation that we that we read and study and put our faith in, and in Second uh, Peter, chapter number one, First uh, Peter chapter one, excuse me, and verse no, 
No, it is Second Peter. I'll get to the right book. Verse number 15, Peter tells us of his own eyewitness testimony. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have the, these things always in remembrance. So what did this disciple of Jesus want us to remember? For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. So who's right, Mr. Lennon or Peter? For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So did Peter just make that up? Did the disciples just um, twist it and ruin it for everyone? I keep reading verse 18. This voice which came from heaven we heard, that's Peter, James, and John, when we were with him in the holy mount. Now, if eyewitness testimony weren't enough, which it should be, I mean, you have two or three witnesses, every word is established. <clears throat> he says we have also a more sure word of prophecy. The word of God. A more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. The light of the holy word of God. That's what gives us hope. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Far from twisting the intent of Jesus' gospel, this, uh, this undeserved, sanctifying, deploying of regular, unremarkable people into an amazing ministry, to me, demonstrates beyond doubt the power of God, and it ensures a grateful, humble people of God. Faith is the essence of the Christian life. Believers are justified by faith without the works of the law. From the beginning, that's at the outset of all of this, we're children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul wrote of the, the, the Christian life, as uh, Galatians 2.20, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live, how? By the faith of the Son of God. The Christian life is a life of faith. We talked about Thomas in John chapter 20 and verse 29, where um, Jesus told him, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Faith is the essence of the Christian life. Faith, notes the writer of Hebrews, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Even those whose faith is strongest go through times where that faith is challenged, where that faith comes under testing. The Bible makes it clear that all through redemptive history, God is the encourager of His people, confirming and strengthening their faith. Faith in God's Word is deepened when we live out our lives in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 1, verse 39, describes for us Mary's visit to Elizabeth. And this is her uh, cousin, according to the translation we have, a family member. Verse 39 of Luke, excuse me, Luke chapter 1. And Mary arose in those days 
and went into the hill country. Maybe you want to highlight these next couple of words with haste. With haste. Into a city of Judah. Now one writer pointed out in this uh, phrase here, there, there seems to be a calling back to Old Testament Scriptures regarding the birth of Samuel with the language centering around uh, the hill country of, of Judea. This is where Mary goes. Question, why is she going there with haste? We just looked together last time about how Gabriel had appeared to this young girl and told her that God was about to fulfill the covenantal promises that He made to Abraham and David through this new covenant that Jesus Christ is coming to establish through His blood. Why was Mary running? Running in a good way. Why was she making haste to confirm, maybe, or just to go visit family? She believed God. Just like Abraham, she believed God and it was counted to her for righteousness. We might say that about Mary with this instance. We have her making haste because God had just told her, hey, your cousin Elizabeth, it was beyond impossible. God's done the impossible through her. Saddle up the camel. Time to go. Now, this is quite a journey in these days, actually. In this day and time, in this Jewish society centered around Galilee, but then Elizabeth uh, being of a, a priestly line uh, with her husband Zechariah, they live on the other side of Samaria. So there's some distance between Nazareth where Mary is and where Elizabeth is closer to the temple. And uh, you have family bonds that are significant. Uh, in fact, uh, there's, there's a whole resource that was put out recently that, that discusses this idea of kinship, family networks, kinship was huge in this day. Along with other things like patronage and reciprocity, cultural things that they just lived by and operated by that, that was just part of their life. Um, you, you have things like honor and shame, kinship, family networks. So as we think about this backdrop, you see here Mary giving care and concern for Elizabeth because she, she hears this news from Gabriel, and I don't pretend to know what was going through her mind. But think about it. Elizabeth wasn't a spring chicken, as we were talking about in Sunday school today. Elizabeth was aged. She was past the years of childbearing. And now the angel Gabriel tells Mary that She's already conceived, Elizabeth has, and, um, and it's the sixth month by the time Gabriel appears to her. So Mary, if she's doing the math, you know, they give you due dates for a reason when you're expecting. Um, Elizabeth's about to enter, what, her third trimester? So think about this. Can you connect with Mary on this? She hears the news from Gabriel and she says, I've got to go down there. I've got to go visit Elizabeth. And she makes haste to do so because of her faith in the Word of God. Hey, when's the last time that you made haste based off something that you were experiencing connected to the Word of God? Can we have the Spirit of Mary? Our faith in God's Word is deepened when we live out our lives in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Mary's acknowledgement of an unborn child by Elizabeth. Think about the hearers that are listening to this news. Now, Elizabeth hid herself away for five months. And uh, there were people waiting for Zechariah outside the temple, praying and waiting for him, and he came out. He couldn't speak to them. You remember all, the, all of those episodes leading up to this. But those that are going to hear this news about a virgin conceiving 
of the Holy Ghost bringing Messiah into the world, what is their level of expectation? Uh, Elizabeth, the way that she receives Mary in this passage, recognizing uh, Mary's unborn child as Messiah, as the Lord, Elizabeth recognizes who this, who this baby will be that Mary will bring forth. And uh, she does so by, uh, by an act of the Holy Spirit. I'll, I'll share that with you here in just a moment, because I, I have a subtitle for the message, but I don't want to detract from it. You have in this a recognition of Jesus' divinity. He's God manifest in the flesh. Even before His birth, He's recognized as being divinely conceived by the Holy Ghost. So the original audience, and who is the original audience? Go back to chapter 1 and verse number 3. You find out Luke is writing to a man named Theophilus. Who is his original audience? Would they not be familiar with the Old Testament prophecies that anticipate a Jewish Messiah? Would they not have understood this encounter between Mary and Elizabeth as significant in the fulfillment of God's promises. So we're looking at Mary's hasty visit. I point you to her departure in verse 39 that I read. Mary arose in those days, went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah. In those days, what days? When Gabriel visited her. And you'll notice this throughout Luke when he writes... uh, the technical term for this would be called polysyndeton, but you'll see it when you see the word and, 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 and. All of these things connected in the narrative by and. So this is another piece of what Luke is relating. So some possible motives for Mary's haste. Why is she going with haste? Could it be social pressure? We read in uh, Matthew about how Joseph was minded to put Mary away privily. I don't know what kind of social pressure this gal would have been under, but uh, she's going to go down and she's going to visit her uh, family, and she's going to be down there for an extended stay for quite some time. Heading to Zacharias' house, he's an ordained priest. Could be, in some regards, maybe comparative to going to a city of refuge (laughs) to wait out the justice of the law. You know, Joseph was minded to put her away privily. Maybe they're trying to wrestle through things. I I don't know. A little of that speculation. That might be in the backdrop, but I think a more contextual reason is that Mary wanted to go. She's moving with haste because of Gabriel's words to her, the word of the Lord concerning Elizabeth's pregnancy, which was still by this point hidden because Elizabeth had hid herself away for five months. Mary knew all about Elizabeth's pregnancy, but remember, at this point in the story, Elizabeth does not know about Mary. One writer points out that the trip may have been uh, what he called theologically motivated, and uh, he draws attention to the word went and uh, talks about the journey aspect of that. That could connote going uh, a going related to the fulfillment of divine purpose, and uh, he ties that to Luke nine fifty one. I'll just uh, read that verse. This is where it says Jesus um, set his face to go to Jerusalem. I believe um, Luke nine fifty one. This is one of those turning points in Luke's narrative as well. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, Jesus. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. No question about it. That's a a theologically motivated journey. Was Mary's? I don't know. I gave you the contextual idea behind that, I think. So Luke is describing Mary's journey with haste as having significance. This is consequential in redemption history. Everything centers around the cross of Christ, right? And we today look back to the cross of Calvary. Gabriel points out um, that Elizabeth 
is with child, and Mary makes haste. Now, this would have been around 80 to 100 miles, we're told. In this day and time, let me, let me do that justice, okay? Um, I can get in my car <laughs> and start driving, and if I'm diligent, Brother Tim mentioned that missions trip. You know, I thought we made pretty decent time. You know, Brother Allen was a real help there, switching out some of these guys, getting behind the wheel. We just drove and drove and drove, and then we stopped and rested and then drove some more. And, and uh, we, we left from Denver, and we got into, uh, we got into uh, Alabama in just a couple of days. And that's a lot of driving from here <laughs> to Mobile. A couple of days. Now, in this day and time, this journey would have taken her anywhere from three to four days to travel from Nazareth to Judah where Elizabeth and Zechariah lived. Put that in perspective. Three or four days, and she's making haste. She put the pedal to the metal, and it took her three or four days probably to get down there. So let's travel back in time humble scene in Nazareth with picturing this young girl, Mary, her heart just brimming with uncertainty, with reverence, with awe. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. That's how we left Mary last time. As an angel appears to her with a message that would forever alter the course of her life and our history. The world has never been the same since Gabriel appeared to Mary at this moment in human history. Imagine, you have this, this swirl of emotions, if you will. She hears, Messiah is coming, and she's the one that gets to bring Him into the world by the power of the Holy Ghost, her Son, the Messiah of Israel, O come, O come, Emmanuel, born to bring hope to a world that sits on, on the edge of its seat, so to speak, waiting for the fulfillment of God's promise. This isn't just a distant biblical event that we read about in a narrative account from Luke. It's more than that. This is a story of Mary's faith this is a story of Mary's courage. And faith and courage go hand in hand. The extraordinary ways, the supernatural ways in which God shows up in our everyday, ordinary lives. That's what we're seeing. Uh, who was this quote from? Elizabeth Elliot. That's who this is. A different Elizabeth than we're reading about in the Bible, but Elizabeth Elliot. You know that name if you've studied missions. She said this, God never does anything to you that isn't for you. Imagine the, the bustling streets of Nazareth. Now, I just put a kind of a, an oxymoron in your mind. I don't know that the streets of Nazareth would be bustling, but I got your attention, didn't I? Hopefully, maybe. Nazareth, no. Probably it smells fairly earthy as you're walking around Nazareth. The scent of fresh earth. The, maybe the, the distant sound of, well, we can use this one because we know what uh, Jesus' earthly adopted father did as a profession. Maybe the sound of carpenter's hammers in the background. I don't know. Carpenters at work. Right here, Nazareth. Just an ordinary setting. Mary receives an extraordinary message. Picture her. Young girl, her life ahead of her. All the hopes and dreams like any of us might have as we're, we're anticipating life. And then suddenly you face a divine calling that's going to change the world. How profound. Notice her greeting. Look at verse number 40. She made haste. She comes to the hill country of Judah. She entered into the house of Zechariah. And um, don't just read past this word too quickly. Saluted. Elizabeth. Similar greeting, um, if you look at Exodus 18.7, similar in the way that, uh, that they would greet each other. Let me turn back there. 
and read Exodus 18, 7. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obedience and kissed him, and they asked each other of their welfare, and they came into the tent. Greetings and salutations. Remember that from, uh, from the children's book, Charlotte's Web? <laughs> Greetings and salutations. She saluted Elizabeth. How are you doing? There's an exchange. How have you been? They're greeting each other. Hey, look at what God, look at what God's doing. See, this is a special reunion between those two ladies. And Zacharias, you know, typical guy, sitting in the back not saying a word. That's a joke, by the way. No? <laughs> okay, that was bad. I'm a terrible joke teller, I guess. <laughs> Here's Zechariah. He's mute in the background. Now, I have to explain that, right? Because we have guests with us today. Zechariah was stricken mute as the sign by Gabriel that God was going to bring the forerunner for Messiah through his wife. And so Zechariah couldn't talk if he wanted to, but Mary and Elizabeth are greeting each other. Here's an ancient greeting for you. Italian architect, he was a believer, Fra... Giovanni, 1513, I salute you. There is nothing I can give you which you have not, but there is much that while I cannot give you, you can take. No heaven can come to us unless our hearts find rest in it today. Take heaven. No peace lies in the future which is not hidden in the present. Take peace. The gloom of the world is but a shadow Behind it, yet within our reach, is joy. Take joy. And so, at this Christmas time, I greet you with the prayer that for you, now and forever, the day breaks and the shadow, shadows flee away. Did you get that? Take some heaven with you today. Take a little bit with you, will you? Spread it all around. Take some peace with you today from the Prince of Peace. Take some peace and share that. Take some joy. There's enough gloom to go around for everybody. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Hey, take some joy with you today as you go from here. Making haste. How long do you think it would take for you to drive from the northernmost point in Alaska, to the southernmost tip of Florida. How long could you drive that? How long would it take you to drive that? Here's a hint. The distance from Prudhoe Bay, now I've never been there, Alaska, Prudhoe Bay, to Key West, Florida, exceeds 5,400 miles. In 2004, it took Gary Egan of Salt Lake City, only a hundred hours to make the trip on a motorcycle. Whatever blows your hair back. <laughs> also imagine riding a motorcycle some 2,900 miles from New York City to San Francisco in 47 hours and 41 minutes. Michael Nebone did just that. Process was uh, setting a 24-hour endurance record of 1,704 miles. Again, whatever blows your hair back. You might imagine the speed limit was broken along the way if he's making that kind of time. Not around Denver, never around Denver. Mary and Elizabeth, they live in slower moving times. Their world is, is a lot smaller than ours. That's one thing I immediately noticed uh, when I went to Israel and saw Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, uh, with my own eyes. If you take Colorado, how we have our mountains and, and, and the terrain and, and the beauty that we have here, and just kind of shrink it all down, 
you've got Eretz Israel. You've got the land of Israel. If you take Israel and just kind of spread it out, that's why when we moved out here, you know, I didn't hesitate to call this uh, the promised land of America. <laughs> no? Okay, well, I might have been mistaken as somebody on the other side of the Mississippi coming out here and standing in awe of the Rocky Mountains. Forgive me. <laughs> I guess you all get used to it out here. Don't ever get used to those Rocky Mountains, the grandeur. But they do live, you know, in a much smaller place than ours, figuratively speaking. And, I mean, think about how surprised they might have been at, at the distances we can travel in an hour. Wow. Mind-blowing. Haste, what I'm saying, haste is a relative idea. Now, everybody in Denver drives with haste. We got that one down. That's not the haste that Mary's talking about. Luke's talking about with Mary. Mary's journey in haste. This would have been painful for us today. Agonizingly slow. It's like me driving through a construction zone with somebody behind me that can't get around me. That, that's how you know, we would feel if we were having to travel at Mary's speed of haste. Okay. No. The purpose behind her haste was a noble purpose. She believed the Word of God. Do we have the perspective to acknowledge the kind of haste that Mary had? So you, you reflect on Mary's experience. She gets this word from Gabriel and she makes a beeline with haste to go visit Elizabeth because of the word of the Lord that came to her. When's the last time you made haste based off something that God showed you in His Word? And you said, man, I've got to do this. I can't let any more time go on this. I invite you to pause for just a moment. Think about a time in your life when maybe you faced uncertainty yourself or you were facing a significant challenge. How did your faith guide you? Maybe turn to the person sitting next to you and say, hey, you got time over lunch today? I'd like to share with you how my faith guided me through you fill in the blank. How did your faith guide you? How might Mary's story of just the simple thing of her going with haste, how does that inspire us to respond to God's call? Even when it's unexpected, maybe even daunting, Making tracks to confirm the word of the Lord to celebrate with Elizabeth. Are you making tracks, friend, to the word of God that has been given to you? How long has it been? You've not missed the bus if you're still breathing. There's still time to get on this Bible bus. Get on board the Bible bus. Start making some tracks through the word of God with haste. So we've seen Mary's haste. Let's look at what occurred a little more deeply when she arrived. Notice the second thing I would point out to you this morning here, the spirits moving, the signs and wonders. Verse number 41, we keep reading and we find um, a leaping baby Baptist. <laughs> Got any Bapticostals in here? <laughs> You're going to be leaping before you leave today. Verse 40, 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, don't miss this, don't miss this, don't miss this. The babe leaped in her womb. And then what happened? And, there's that polysynthesis, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Hey, something is about to happen here. <laughs> Mary shows up, and at the very salutation, remember, we left off talking about the salutation, the greeting. At the greeting, as soon as this babe heard Mary's voice, woo! <laughs> start jumping on the pulpit. Maybe not. Mary's greeting, here's your equation, for those that need me to spell it out, plus the baby's leaping, form an inclusion to this whole passage. around, And, and, and it's all centered 
around Elizabeth's humility. Don't read this the wrong way. Don't read it the wrong way. Humility. Let me point out some things about the immediate context. They're in a private residence. They're in Mary, uh, uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth's home. Zacharias, the priest, has been made mute. He can't speak. I'm just pointing out some facts. The baby boy in her womb, who's the forerunner for Messiah, is the one that initiates this whole episode of Elizabeth being filled with the Holy Ghost and then making a prophetic statement. In an Old Testament dispensation. Now, I gave you a lot to think about right there. Chew on that for a while. Now, I don't have time to unpack all, the, all of what I mean by that, but, but I, I said everything I did on purpose and succinctly and con- concisely because I just want to point out some of the surrounding circumstances. Brephos is the word that uh, the great physician, used, or the beloved physician, excuse me, the great physician through him, you know, by the moving of the Holy Spirit, but uh, the beloved physician uses the term brephos uh, to, to give us this idea of the babe. And um, it's the same word that will be used later of the babe lying in a manger, brephos, talking about this baby boy in Elizabeth's womb. You can compare Luke 2.16 with Luke 1.44 where I'm at right here. Jewish tradition is familiar with the idea that, that unborn children can take part in the events of the world and anticipate prenatally their later positions in life. Wow. Wow. Maybe we missed something in the Colorado legislature. No? Do I need to say it again? Jewish tradition is familiar with the idea that unborn children may take part in events of the world. Oh, it's just a fetus. The Jewish mindset was familiar with this idea, and I don't want to get into that. I'm, I'm going to move on. Okay, can anticipate prenatally their later positions in life. <clears throat> John uses the expression describing John the Baptist. John chapter three verse twenty nine. Go look it up. Anticipation. John witnesses the one who comes after him. So while Elizabeth responds to the greeting, the unborn John responds directly to the presence of the unborn Jesus. Skirtao, that's the word for leaping that John did, and it's used twice in the passage, by the way. Leaping. That's how the Baptist did it. like David leaping before the ark. 2 Samuel 6, verse 16. Uh, Robertson in his word pictures, good commentary if you are looking for a good resource for just seeing the vividness of the language, he points out a common enough incident with unborn children. Genesis 25, 22, he references that. But Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit to understand what had happened to Mary. And I remember this. You know, when we were expecting, and one of the amazing things to me, I was just mesmerized anytime uh, our unborn children would move in the womb. And, you know, as the child grows in the womb, you can obviously note things, and sometimes my wife would get quite a surprise. But there's something different about this one. Leaping in the womb like this, coupled with Elizabeth's being filled with the Holy Ghost. Can I just say that... Um, the, the embryo within Elizabeth is not called an unviable tissue mass. 
Elizabeth, also at the time she was filled with the Holy Ghost, I would also point out some other circumstances that occurred that we can see in the passage. She did not speak in tongues. There was no other charismatic manifestation. Just facts of the plain reading of the passage of Scripture, okay? I'm not trying to pick on people here. I'm just pointing out the details of what was going on around Elizabeth when Mary showed up. Babies make the difference. Hear me well. There was a a remarkably revealing article, and I'm out of time, so I'll probably try to finish with this here. Remarkable revealing article appeared August 15th, 1983, issue of Time Magazine. Uh, August 15th, 1983. So uh, it was entitled, What Do Babies Know? Michael Lewis, he was a psychologist. He presided over the data being gathered by the Institute for the Study of Child Development at Rutgers Medical School, New Brunswick, New Jersey. And among startling facts, babies are born, uh, to quote the article, legally blind. So although they're unable to see, a newborn nevertheless holds up a hand as if uh, examining it within seven minutes after birth, according to the article. Their ears, normally, their ears function well. Within a few weeks, they recognize the sound of their mother's voice. Incidentally, babies seem to prefer the tone of the female voice over that of the male. I guess it depends. At 12 hours old, 12 hours old, an infant which has never tasted anything, not even his or her mother's milk, gurgles with satisfaction on receiving a drop of sugar water. 23 days of age, the baby can imitate adults. Uh Uh-oh. Beyond risks and costs of rearing children today, having a baby is an act of faith and hope. It represents a belief in better things to come. When a wrong needs writing, when a truth needs telling, when a song needs needs singing. When a soul needs saving God, what does He do? He sends a baby. A little baby thing. J. Vernon McGee always quotes that <laughs> so many times. A little baby thing that made a, made, made a woman cry. That's how God came in the world to accomplish this. And so I just challenge you, maybe this afternoon, keep reading the rest of these verses. Look at the praise and prophecy that's given by Elizabeth. And then don't stop there. Come back tonight, and I'll continue discussing with you some of the beauties that we see in Mary's beautiful, uh, what's been called the Magnificat, that's Latin, to magnify, to praise and exalt the Lord. Come back tonight, and we'll spend time talking about that. Dr. Luke, the poet who gives us all the songs of Christmas, this is the first one, and it comes from Elizabeth. What did God do for us? This baby in Elizabeth's womb, as soon as he heard the voice of Mary recognizing the presence of the Messiah, leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you today to recognize the presence of the Lord in your life. And I want you to to react like John did. Now, you don't have to go leaping out of here, but if you do, that's all right too. Just go leaping right down the sidewalk of Westminster. People will be wondering, what's going on over there at that church? Maybe I need to go see what's going on at that church. No, don't get all charismatic here, but leaping. Can you today... Appropriate the presence of God as He came to be our Savior. Can you appropriate that and take your own leap of faith?